Sally was having a horrible day when the phone rang. She answered, she said hello. She felt relief when the voice on the other side of the phone was very cheerful and kind. How are you doing, darling? What kind of day are you having? Sally felt like her dam just broke. And she started blurting out, Oh, Mother, I'm having a horrible day. The baby's fussy. He won't eat and won't go to sleep. The big washing machine broke down. I haven't had a chance to go shopping. And besides that, I twisted my ankle and I'm having to hobble around. On top of that, the house is an absolute mess and I'm supposed to have company tonight. Nothing is going right. And she was bawling and sobbing all the way through this. The mother was absolutely shocked and was all sympathy. Oh, darling, just sit down, relax, close your eyes. I'll be over in about half an hour. I'll do your shopping. I'll clean up the house. I'll cook your dinner for you. I'll tend to the baby. I'll call my repairman because I know he'll come over and fix your washing machine right away. Now stop your crying. I'll take care of everything. In fact, I'll even call Morty at the office and tell him he better come home and help out for once. Morty? Asked Sally, who's Morty? Why, Morty, your husband. Isn't this 555-1374? No, this is 555-1375. Oh, I'm sorry, I must have got a wrong number. There was a short pause before Sally asked, does that mean you're not coming over? <laughs> Sometimes we need help. If we're honest, most of the time we need help. That's why we sang songs like that last one. And where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Last week I looked and I preached about this walking the path to become more and more like Jesus. And, and several times during that sermon last week I mentioned about how we need help from the Holy Spirit to accomplish walking like Jesus. I believe it's impossible our, on our own to walk like Jesus if we don't have help if we don't have the helper, if we don't have the Holy Spirit. And God, knowing what we are like, He gave us the Holy Spirit to help us walk that path. Today I want to continue this series of sermons about walking the path. And I want to look from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 26, and see how the Holy Spirit is our helper to help us walk and walk more like Jesus. But first, let's start with prayer. Lord, I thank You for Your love. I thank You for the blessings You give to us. And I ask, Lord, that you would especially help us. Help us to walk more like Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit be the one who helps control us and guide us and direct us and renew our minds daily through the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. My outline today is not my usual three-point outline with several sub-points, but rather I want to look at seven things, seven things that Paul wrote about, about the Holy Spirit, how he can help us stop the desires of our flesh, starting in verse 13 with how the Holy Spirit can help prevent us from letting our freedom turn into an opportunity for the flesh. He can prevent us from letting our freedom turn into an opportunity for the flesh. Verse 13 states, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. While we were up in Idaho for the board meeting for Boise Bible College and then for the conference up there, I heard a lesson at church on how all things are lawful, but not everything builds up. Not everything is good. I find it interesting that Paul would have to write about this concept several times to Christians. They weren't looking at this passage. They were looking at other passages where it specifically talked about the same thing, about all things may be lawful. You have a freedom, but it may not be the best thing to do, and it can become an opportunity for sin. And many Christians, especially today, uh, we know that Christ came to set us free from the law, but there are some Christians who, like those in Rome, remember in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? No, God forbid. Some people look at this, well, if we don't have to live by the law and we have freedom, let's just do whatever we want to do, and everybody's just going to have to forgive me. I get to do what I please. It reminds me of a story I read about a long time ago about two young boys one was slightly older than the other, maybe a year or two older, and they were waiting for their breakfast waffles to pop up out of the toaster. 
And when that toaster popped up a waffle, they both grabbed the single waffle that was there. Both of them held on and said, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And, and the mother was going like, oh, oh no, that you can't fight over that. Don't you remember what you learned at church yesterday about how Jesus wasn't about his will, it was about other people's will and you need to be a servant and just treat other people right. And, and, and so they, they were holding that and they didn't really want to let go. Finally, the older one said, all right, mom's right. You be Jesus, and I get this one. <laughs> we kind of think it's funny when it's the kids. But it's actually sad when it's adults who are supposedly letting the Holy Spirit guide them to become more and more Christ-like. And even though both boys had the freedom to be first with the waffle... They actually needed to let the Holy Spirit guide them so that they would have the same attitude in themselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, although he existed in the very form of God, did not regard his equality with God as a thing to be grasped and held on to, but he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a bondservant and became obedient, even obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. We need to let others come first in our lives. Sure, we can go cut in line. That's our freedom. We can get them to be in first place. But we actually need to be people who think about others and let them go ahead. Let the Holy Spirit transform us into a Christ-like person, not letting our freedom take an opportunity for the flesh, but rather make sure that we live for Jesus Christ at all times. The Holy Spirit also can help us fulfill the whole law. Verse 14 specifically says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Holy Spirit can actually help us grow to truly love, to love as God has commanded in the law. He is the one who can let us love. He can let us love as Jesus commanded with his new commandment. Here's my new commandment, that you would love one another even as I have loved you. When I look back at my life, I can see a growth in my love for other people. Because I remember being a child, I didn't have a whole lot of love. In fact, I fought with my brother and my two sisters quite often. And I can remember many times my mother or even my dad telling me, you have to love them, you have to quit fighting. I didn't want to quit fighting them. (laughs) I wanted things my way. I didn't care what they were doing. It was not an easy commandment to love them. In fact, my mother often says that I didn't want to play with my two sisters. And I said, well, they're girls. You know, they got cooties. And she said, they're sisters. They don't have cooties. (laughs) It, It took me a long time to get this to sink in. And finally, as I started to grow, I started realizing that I need to love. And I grew older. I learned to love my siblings. And I learned to love other people, especially people who treated me well. It was easy to love them. There were other people it was harder to love. And I can still remember when we started having children. And I had some toys prior to having children. It was really hard for me to let my wife let the kids play with my toys. (laughs) I liked my toys. I didn't want them to play with them and destroy them. It was hard for me, but now I've gotten to the point where it doesn't bother me to love my kids and to even sacrifice for them. And most of us, as we've grown in Christ, we have realized that we have gotten fewer and fewer enemies, fewer and fewer people we don't like. And I've grown grown way beyond just tolerating some people to actually being willing to love them. And it's a process that happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't think we can really love unless the power of the Holy Spirit is in us to help us fulfill the law, to love one another. It's a process that only begins with the power of the Holy Spirit inside us, helping us see people as Jesus sees them, helping me to love, and thus fulfill the word of the law of the commandments of God. Verse 15 then goes on and says how the Holy Spirit can help us stop fighting with one another. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. There was a time in my life that if someone did something to anger me, I had no problem to not just fight back to them, but even share that person's name with other people That did you know what so-and-so did? Did you know what? And I would tell that name. It did not bother me because I wanted other people to join with me in fighting against that person. 
it has actually taken me a long time, and I'm still not perfect, to stop this evil fighting of one another. It's taken me a long time to learn by the power of the Holy Spirit to let things roll off my back and just keep going on and try not to influence everybody else to hate those same people. It's hard to do, but it's only possible if the Holy Spirit takes control of us. The Holy Spirit can help remind us that our battle, according to the scripture, is not against flesh and blood, but it is against rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The Holy Spirit can help us. He can help us away the battles that we face in this world and help us to know which ones are going to have an eternal difference and which ones really don't matter. The Holy Spirit living inside of us can help us realize that many of the things that people fight one another for are just not things worthy to fight for. Like who really cares what color carpet we have? What color chairs we have? What brand they are? Who really cares what color the walls are? Who really cares? I mean, we used to have a, a couple in the church here who has since gone home to be with the Lord. And I remember going over to their house one time and up on their wall, they had a statement on the wall. I can't remember the exact words, but basically the words were, uh, <clears throat> in a hundred years, will this matter? And I started thinking about that. That's kind of a neat little thing. It was kind of funny because those same people really had issues about things that really didn't matter a hundred years down the road. But it's interesting that they would put that up there. And there are certain things that we do have to stand up on and stand for sure because if it's in God's word, we stand upon it. And we don't just let those things slide. Those things will matter in a hundred years, a thousand years, all the way down through history. But there's a lot of things that people fight over in churches that really doesn't matter. Even in churches in the New Testament, there were fights. Remember in the scriptures, you can read about the fights several times. Remember in the book of Acts, there's these two guys getting ready to go on a missionary journey. I'm not going with that guy. No, we're not taking him. Yes, we are. We should take this guy. No, we won't. And they actually split and went in different directions. There were others who were fighting over what name shall we call? And, and Paul writes about that in their letters to the Corinthians. And, and there were people who were fighting over which brother is the better brother or, or fighting over who's first and who's most important. What foods can we eat? When can we eat? There were fights over the ancestry of people. But when the Holy Spirit actually guides us, we can put all those differences aside and we can walk in love. Let the Holy Spirit help you to live more and more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit helps us stop the desires of our flesh, stopping us from letting our freedoms turn into opportunities for sin. He helps us fulfill the whole law by learning to love. He helps us stop fighting one another. Fourth, as verses 16 through 21 points out, the Holy Spirit can help us not live by the fleshly desires. Let me read Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, sensuality or enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this, of which I have forewarned you, just as I also have forewarned you, and that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, the Holy Spirit was given as a helper, the helper. I know there are people who treat the Holy Spirit as, as if he's not valid for today's world. And they look at it because certain manifestations of the Holy Spirit are pretty rare today. Like the healings of the apostles and when their shadows would fall on people and people were instantly healed or, or a handkerchief was carried from them and healed people. But the Holy Spirit is still alive and active and working in us and we are not to live by the flesh but by the Spirit. 
He is there to help us so we don't live by our fleshly desires. He is there to tell us no, 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 no. Can't you hear me? No. When we're being tempted to do something and our flesh society is going like, yeah, I want to do that. And the Holy Spirit's going like, no, 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 stop that. I know there are Christians who say, well, I was born this way regarding certain sins. And I know that can definitely be true. How many of us have ever watched a toddler? I've seen a toddler. Do they ever have jealousy? Mine, 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 mine. Do they ever have an envying? Mine, mine, mine. Do they ever have outbursts of anger? <laughs> Do they ever have disputes, fights, etc.? I mean, maybe our kids were exceptional and they were the only kids in the entire world that ever had those situations. <laughs> But I can truly remember some all-out battles between our kids. Because guess what? They were born that way. They did have those tendencies to do those sinful things. But you know what we did? We prayed for them. We trained them with the scriptures. We led them to Jesus Christ. We watched them make decisions for Christ and be baptized into Christ Jesus to put it to death that old self of sin, to rise up as a new creature in Christ. And then we got to see the power of the Holy Spirit working inside their lives, transforming them to be able to say no to the desires of the flesh, to that selfishness, that greed, that burst of anger, the disputes and all those things, and instead grow to love Jesus Christ and the fruit of the Spirit. I know there, there will peop, are people who would love to argue, well, you need to just be justified of the various sins of their flesh. It's perfectly fine if you have outbursts of anger because they're so short, and then they're over. It's perfectly fine to be cussing and swearing and drunkenness or sexual sins, etc., but the Bible does not excuse us to allow us to practice such sins. It specifically states that those who practice, those who are continually getting involved and do in these things, they are not letting the Holy Spirit change them, they're not letting the Holy Spirit transform them, and they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's that plain. And God is the one who said that, not Malcolm, it was God. And God specifically gave us the Holy Spirit so we could battle against the desires of our flesh to lead us, to help us, to not live by fleshly desires, but we would be changed. We can be transformed into the image of Christ by the power of the Helper, the Holy Spirit, who, can be, who was given to us when we repented and we were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit help you walk the path to be transformed into this aspect of walking more and more like the image of His Son, Jesus. The Holy Spirit can help produce in us the fruit of the Spirit. Verses 22 and 23 specifically state, but the fruit, and notice it says singular, fruit, singular, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. There are way too many Christians who would rather say this, this is the fruits of the Spirit, plurality. But it is singular. It is pl the fruit of the Spirit. And when Christians want to look at it as plurality, understand why. Because there are certain fruits I like. I like apples. I like grapes. I like pears. I like peaches. I like pineapples. I like things like that. But there are certain ones I don't like. Karen, you're saying one of them. Oranges. I do not like oranges. I don't like them at all. <laughs> I don't want them on a boat. I don't want them on a float. I don't, <laughs> I don't like oranges. I don't know why. I just don't. And there are certain people who want to do the same thing regarding the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, yeah, I want to have some of that love. Oh, man, I want that joy. I want that peace. Skip the next one. We don't want patience. I don't want to have to have patience. I don't like that one. Let's leave that one out. But you know what? The Holy Spirit is there to help us have every one of the characteristics of this singular fruit. Singular. We need every bit of this. I ran across a humorous story 
about a boy who would sneak out of his second story bedroom whenever he wanted to get out at night. And he'd crawl out his window. There was a, a fruit tree right outside his window. He'd climb down the fruit tree and then he'd go off and find his buddies and then he would do things at night. Well, one morning at breakfast, his dad was saying, you know what, we've had that fruit tree out back for I don't know how long it's been. I can't remember the last time I've seen any fruit on that tree. I guess I'm going to cut that thing down. Boy had a, a, a problem. If he cuts it down, I won't be able to sneak out at night. So that night he went out and he got his buddies. And they bought a whole bunch of apples. And they tied the apples in the tree. The next morning, dad was down there. They were getting ready to eat, eat breakfast. He goes, that is absolutely amazing. That old fruit tree that I said I haven't seen fruit on for years. Suddenly, it's filled with fruit. And what's absolutely amazing about it is, it used to be a pear tree. <laughs> you know, that dad was probably pretty astute. I think he probably figured out what had happened. I don't think he could have been easily fooled. Because a tree is known by its fruit. And when it's full of the wrong kind of fruit, there's something wrong here. And when we're not producing the full fruit of the Spirit, there's something wrong here. We're trying to produce something different than that singular fruit of the Spirit. There's something wrong here. But if we will let the Holy Spirit guide us and help us, He will help us produce the correct fruit of the Spirit. We must let the Holy Spirit come into our lives and help us stop the desires of our flesh to live for Him, transformed into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And verse 24 then goes on to show us how that the Holy Spirit can actually help us live crucified to our fleshly passions. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with His passions and desires. It's so over in Romans chapter 6, verses 2 through 11, it tells us more fully how this was done. That when we were baptized with Christ, we put to death, we were united with Him in His death, His burial, His resurrection. We crucified our old self of sin to rise up as a new creature in Christ Jesus. Yet even so, we need the Holy Spirit to help us to continue to live crucified to those fleshly desires and passions. I'm reminded of what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. He was talking about when you cast out demons, that if a demon leaves somebody and they go out and wander and can't find any place to come, if they come back and they find that the person that they were cast out of, there is clean, but there's nothing in there, what does that evil spirit do? He goes and gets more evil spirits and comes back and fills him up and makes him worse than he ever was before. And I think about that over and over. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. But if we don't let that Holy Spirit take over in our lives, if we are squelching the Spirit and His power to work in us, if we want to make sure the Holy Spirit's unwelcome in us and we choose to go back to sin, then we're leaving ourselves open to be filled up with something worse. Much worse. And once the fleshly passions were crucified in our baptism, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we must keep Him actively working inside of us so that we don't go back to our sinful past or even worse. The Holy Spirit was given to us to fill us up and help us live crucified to the fleshly desire. And He's given to us to help us stop the desires of the flesh. And then in verses 25 and 26, we learn that the Holy Spirit, He can help us truly walk by the Spirit. <clears throat> if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Last week was really part one of this transformed ser uh, sermon. I was looking at being transformed into the image of Christ. I kept mentioning the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit needs to work in us to transform us, to change us from the inside out, to let us grow into becoming living bodies for Jesus Christ, sacrificing our fleshly lust to grow, to walk by the Spirit in everything we do and say. And that's why this sermon has to fit right together with it. 
Paul even brings us all down to one short statement, verse 26 there. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. In other words, guess what? It's not about you. It's not even about how others seem so much better or so much more holy than us. And oh, I just can't live up to them. Or they're more talented than us. I I don't have those talents. It's all about the power of the Holy Spirit working in each one of us to change us, to become more and more like Christ every day. And if you want to be great, then learn to serve. Let the Holy Spirit change your values into the values that Jesus has. Who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Don't let the fact that you have been set free from the law system to let yourself go back into sin and let sin abound. Live differently, guided by the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit help you grow in love, which truly fulfills the entire law system that you've been set free from, but we still need to live by. Doing what is right, which is love. Let the Holy Spirit stop you from fighting one another over petty things, things that won't matter for all eternity. Stand up on the word of God for the truth, but let the little things go. Let the Holy Spirit help you not to live by the fleshly desires, always wanting to gratify your own lusts and your own desires. Instead, let the Holy Spirit produce in you the real fruit, the true fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit help you live crucified to your sinful fleshly desires. And instead, now let the Holy Spirit guide you and help you that you would truly walk in the Spirit, by the Spirit, without jealousy, without envy, without boasting. Let the Spirit rule in your life. Lord, I ask that you would help us to let the Holy Spirit live in us, to guide us, to direct us. Lord, help us to never forget about the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. How great that power is. How that this power who lives inside of us can change us. Let us be submitted to you in all things in Jesus' name.